Amen. Good morning. How are y'all? Good. Good to see you this morning. Glad you're here. And would you stand with me? We're going to sing a rousing version of Wonderful Grace of Jesus. How about that? If you know your part, sing it. I know that there are some of you who are always going to sing your part. Some of you are looking. If you want a hymnal, here they are. Okay? So you can sing your part if you want to. Wonderful Grace of Jesus, hymn number 338. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. Oh, the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost, by it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost, chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty, for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it, greater far than all my sin and shame, oh magnify the precious name of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled by its transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity. Oh, the wonderful grace of Jesus. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it, greater far than all my sin and shame, oh magnify the precious name of Jesus. that note once but those two and three I just can't do it almost hit it he hideth my soul how about that he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock hymn number 611 a wonderful savior is Jesus my lord a wonderful savior to me he hideth soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my
Jesus, my Lord, he taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. And on the last, when clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. Amen. Y'all can have a seat. I have a few announcements from my, the bullhorn up here from the platform. I've got a couple of them. One of them is an announcement I don't have a slide for yet, but we are hoping to begin very soon, actually, and a daily email that will come to your inbox if you want it. We're not going to force it on you, but if you want it, you want to sign up for it. We're hoping to have 20 people within the congregation of the church, and it could be that one of y'all are within at least 20 of these, 20 people that would take a chapter of Scripture. We're going to start in the New Testament somewhere, and we're going to do a chapter of Scripture per day uh, that will come to your email. Now, Brad Yates said that he would administrate this. He's a new member and said that he'd like to do the administration part of it where we get it and compile it and get it in the same format and send it to people. He'll do that. But the writers is what we're looking for. Someone who will... You'll know your assignment ahead of time. You won't have to do it on the spur of the moment. It won't be the next day, but you'll know ahead of time which chapter is yours. You get a chance to read over it, think about it, and then do something like this. This is my name. You may or may not know me from church. Uh, I Little bio, short. And then this is the chapter that we're reading together today. And then a few thoughts. You have a chance to read commentary, your own personal uh, work on that, and then a couple of application questions, and we have, I think, nine or ten of the elders have already signed up for ten of the spots, but there are spots open if you'd like to be a part of that, if you'd like to write, if you'd like to study, if you'd like to do Bible studies, I'm looking at some faces, I know some people in here who like to do that, if you'd like to be a part of that team, will you let me know afterwards, or let Nick know in the office sometime this week, and we're going to start getting this thing going, we'll do a chapter a day, if we get literally on the same page, Hopefully, it'll help us metaphorically to be on the same page. 
as we study it together. So Carl often says when he's in the other room on Monday nights preaching, he says, my favorite book in the Bible is the one I'm studying right now. And I think that that would be true for all of us. If we take it on, we go, man, this is so, so, so good. You get all the juice out of it if you're trying to squeeze it for somebody else. Anybody have oh, other announcements? Here they are. Monday nights at First B, John 16. Tomorrow night, John 16, the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a disciple. That's great. Meal uh, is going to be comfort food. Ooh, sounds so good. He, he kind of told us what it was going to be this morning. It's a good night to have meal. Music is good. It's a 9 o'clock band. It's also the Monday night band. And then a message from John 16. Awana is happening at the same time on Monday nights. 6 o'clock in this room starting off and spreading out from there. Uh, if you want to get the weekly email bulletin for the church, just the normal one like our bulletin that we used to do on paper, you can go to firstbjackson.org and sign up for it. If you would like to uh, get this email that I'm talking about, this Bible reading plan, it would be a, a good idea, and that will be available through there eventually. We just had our congregational meeting. All of the measures passed. The budget, uh, Jim Reed is been elected to serve on the BOT as financial secretary, and Steve is up for another three years as elder. Um, there is a Sisters Saved by Grace. This is kind of the name of the study on Wednesday, uh, Thursday evenings, Thursday evenings, 6 to 8. Uh, Nancy Baxter has been leading this study, but there are several in the room who come to that regularly, and it's a great small group of people who are studying together. This reminds me of another Another announcement about women's ministry. So if you are interested in women's ministry and you want to help with women's ministry or help brainstorm what it is that we need to do for women's ministry, next week, there's not a slide up there, but next week at 10 o'clock, uh, anyone who is interested are going to meet for a brainstorming session in the library downstairs. So women's ministry, 10 o'clock, brainstorming session downstairs in the library next week in between services. Uh, this is a kind of a technical issue. I used to get notifications uh, whenever we were on Facebook. We were on Facebook Live doing our streaming since COVID, well, since five years before COVID started, but really we got uh, to be familiar with it, I think, during COVID. And it would notify me, hey, First B is live right now. And we switched to YouTube, and my phone no longer does that for me. And so I, I'm like, oh, yeah, I missed that. Sorry, I don't know what that is. Usually I'm the one preaching, or I'm in the band, so I don't miss a whole lot. But if you want to be notified when we're doing something, on YouTube, you can go up in that little bell in the corner. If you hit that, you can turn on your notifications, and it'll let you know, First B's live. This, this channel's going live in just a few minutes. And so that'll help. Click the bell. If you don't know, ask Nick. That's what we do. We need te te technical questions. If, we, if it's about sound, we ask Blake. If it's about the Internet, we ask Nick. I think that's it. Does anybody else have anything I've forgotten, omitted? I mentioned the... I mentioned both of the ones that I don't have slides for. Would you stand, and we will hope that that screen goes black here in a minute, and we'll sing, Change My Heart, O God. Change the slide, O Blake, and then we'll sing, Change My Heart, O God. Come number 564. Thank you. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. my heart, O oh God, may I be like you, you are the potter, I am the clay, mold me and make me, this is why. that one again. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever 
change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Amen. What a beautiful song. I need thee every hour. If he's going to change our hearts, we have to recognize that we need him every hour. I need thee every hour, O oh, gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, O oh, bless me now, my Savior. Worship through giving portion. Y'all can have a seat, and I'll ask the elders to come forward, elders and ushers. Uh, and would you pray with me? God, I thank you for uh, a time in the day where we can come together. We need thee every hour, but Lord, we come together acknowledging our need and acknowledging you uh, in our praise of you. But Lord, we want to give so that others may know. So I pray, Lord, that we would know you and we would know you. Uh, deeply, we would really get to know you, and Lord, that you would transform our lives. We would begin to act like you, like one of these songs, that you would transform our heart, change our hearts, and make us more like you. I pray also, Lord, that uh, your word would ever be on our lips, that we would be uh, ready with a word of testimony when people ask us for the hope that is within us. Lord, would you show us your will and your way and allow us the strength to walk it out? Would you show us, Lord, so that we can be obedient to your word? In Jesus' name, we ask your blessing on this offering, that you would do your will and your way to the very uttermost parts. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Judy. Contemplative praise. That's good. And a sweet by and by. We are up to Matthew 6. We're going forward. So we, I think this is the fourth, third or fourth sermon in Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, Luke's version is shorter. I did that in three sermons total. We're just barely halfway through. Uh, by the end of this sermon, we'll be halfway through Matthew's version of it, which is three chapters long in Scripture. So Matthew 6, we're going to go 1 through 24 today, but we're going to minus out the Lord's Prayer. I, I've got a reason for doing that, but I also, the Lord's Prayer is fantastic, and I'll come back to it, I promise. But uh, for the purposes of today, I think the point is not to just recite that by rote, of course. You know, in, in basketball, when I was in basketball in high school, we would lean in right before we'd huddle up. We'd say, hey, say who we're going to, you know, what we're going to do, who's going to do what. We'd lean in. We'd all put our hands in. We'd go, our oh, Father, we are in heaven. Trespass against us. We would do that as a part of the preparation for the game. It's between the layups and between the tip-off, and we'd lean in, and all of us would say the Lord's Prayer. Some of those guys are believers. Some of them weren't, but it was almost superstitious to the point if we forgot to do it before the game and we were getting, a, and getting our... The Heinz beaten in the first quarter, we would lean back into a huddle and we'd say it then, right? Because it was almost like an amulet, something that we could do in order to make it better for us. And that's just not the point of the Lord's Prayer. So I don't want for that to be the case. We'll get to it in the middle of this. I'll say another little quip about it. And then we'll go uh, and come back to it later and examine it more thoroughly. This starts off, it's kind of an unusual breaking point right here for me to stop the the slides, but take care not to practice your righteousness. If I just stopped and put a period right there, that would not be biblical at all, right? You just think, oh, wait a second. Take care not to practice your righteousness. I highlighted the to practice because it's the same verb as the, uh, when I mentioned that we are Christ's, uh, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus or made performed, created, done, that word is this word. Take care not to make a big deal about. Take care not to make a, make a masterpiece of. Take care not to put on display your created righteousness. Take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people. It's saying take care not to do it in the sight of people. Now, if I were to go right there, I know most of y'all's faces, I saw you last week, and I know that you heard this verse last week. Verse 16 from chapter 5 says, Your light, people, disciples, your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. So how can I right now be saying, take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people? Does that sound contradictory to you? It does. Kind of. But it goes on. I've stopped in two uncomfortable places right there. Take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people, when I know that they're supposed to see my good works and glorify my Father who's in heaven, it goes on. It says, to be noticed by them. That's the motivation. To be noticed by them. If that's your motivation, then you're doing this wrong. Okay? Take care not to practice your acts of righteousness in the sight of people. To be noticed by them. That is an improper motivation. And motivation matters. So if, let's say... I mean, we're going to get into a couple of examples. One of them is given to the poor. One of them is praying. One of them is fasting. There are three examples that are given today that we'll cover. But if you gave 100 bucks to be seen by men, whoever received the 100 bucks would still have 100 bucks, right? It's $100. $100 is $100. Spends the same way no matter what the motivation was. But for you, it would be different. If you did it to be seen by someone else as being a benevolent, great, and generous person, then you are doing it for the wrong reason. Now, the person is still blessed. Don't get me wrong. $100 is $100. But you are doing it for the wrong reasons. Motivation matters. Take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people to be noticed by them. Now, there is a very wooden translation of this that I came up with. This is straight up in the order it's written in Greek. Beware. It's a, whoa, watch out. Beware now. Pay attention to this. The righteousness of you, and I think that's significant because we have what we think is righteousness within us, but honestly, if there is any real righteousness within us, it's because it is derived from God. 
Beware now the righteousness of you not to do before men. Don't be doing the righteousness of you before men in order to be seen by them. That clause is not actually a henna clause, it's a prahas clause, but in order to be seen by them is the reason, the motivation. That's the improper motivation. Take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people to be noticed by them. He goes on to say, otherwise you have no reward with your Father who's in heaven. If you do it like this, you're doing it just like the whole world does. And he's saying, you, disciples, are to be different from the world. I mentioned last week, and I'll mention it probably a lot more times, that the real message of Christ, and definitely the Sermon on the Mount, is countercultural in every earthly culture. I can even go so far, I had somebody email me or text me this week, and they said, even church culture, even church culture, the Christian message should not be foreign to us, but oftentimes it is. And I think we'll see that throughout the text today, that he's calling his disciples to an intense standard of obedience to the Father who sees all that is done in secret. Take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. I won't go into the theology of rewards. I will make a statement. I believe that the reward that Jesus is speaking of and Matthew is speaking to right here in his gospel is to know God completely, to live eternally with him, and to have full consciousness of his goodness and to eventually, on that great mighty day, be actually glorified so that we can comprehend him even deeper, to know just as we are known. I think that is reward enough. Now, we, we could discuss the theology of rewards and how they get to be there. Jesus is saying, if you do things just like the world does them, you're doing them just like the world does them. It doesn't have anything to do with my kingdom. There's a different way, and he's going to outline that for us right here. So when you give to the poor. Now, this is presupposed that you are going to give to the poor, you being disciples. When you, my disciples, give to the poor, it is presupposed that disciples will give to the poor. It's not just for the people who have the gift of generosity. It's not just for a certain segment of people, people who go into vocational ministry or mercy ministry. It is for disciples. It's presupposed that when you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you. Don't make a big deal about it. As the hypocrites do. Hypocrites, the play actors, the ones who uh, wear a mask that is contrary to their heart. As the, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. See, that says that church culture even is challenged by these rules. The synagogues are the places of assembly. That's where God's people got together. He's saying, when you, disciples, give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you make a big, big deal about it, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. That is the way of the world. And I can say that there are plaques aplenty giving praise to people for donations and gifts that they have given. And the text here goes on to say, again, the motivation, so that they will be praised by people. So that they will be, that's the motivation again stated. I like this uh, word in Greek. I think that it helps with our head on in order to be seen by people or so that they will be praised by people. The word there is doxatso, doxatso. And this particular one for the grammar nerds in here, it's an aorist subjunctive passive third person plural from doxatso. Doxatso thing, scene. It means so that they might be praised by men. Oh, not just praised, the word is to be rendered or esteemed as glorious. In a very wide application, to be glorified, to be honored, to be, have glory bestowed upon. Does that sound like something that disciples should be seeking after? No. If we are to be on the spotlight, we should be giving praise to God. We should be deflecting any that comes our way towards him. Truly, I say to you that they have their reward in full. If they ring a bell or they sound a trumpet or they let everybody know, hey, look what I just did, they have already received their reward in full. But 
strong disjunctive there. But when you, disciples, when, again, it's presupposed that you will be giving, if you're a disciple, it's presupposed. It's not just for a select few. It's for all of God's people. When you give to the poor, when you, disciples, I'm going to keep on saying that because this message was delivered to a lot of different kinds of people. They were the people that showed up. But Jesus is calling us, those of us who are disciples, to a higher standard. And he's speaking to his disciples. Matthew's very explicit about that. When you, disciples, give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, I know the tax code goes against that. They want to have every single dime accounted for, everything that you have given, in every kind of way that you do it. I think that Jesus' point is don't think about it for too long. Don't pay so much attention to it. Just be obedient to the Spirit's leading. And not letting the left hand know what the right hand is doing is pretty, I mean, that's, that's hard for us to separate out. But he's saying don't labor over this and keep such a close accounting. If I ask you to give it, give it so that your charitable giving will be in secret. It shouldn't be something that everybody should hear about or know about. Even your left hand shouldn't know what your right hand puts in the plate. It's secret. So that your charitable giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret, he'll be the one that will reward you. If you do it to be seen before people, you get your reward. I, I actually... Um, Go to some length, not to, I know what is given, and we had the business meeting, and I know how it turns out, but I don't know who gave what, and I put measures into place so that I won't know. I can say generally to the whole church, thank you for giving, but I don't know who gives what, because I don't want the temptation of knowing who gives what. The Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That's between you and God, not between you and the pastor and God. And when you pray, oh, I love this too. And when you pray, it's presupposed. Disciples will pray. If you're my people, you're going to listen to me. And you're going to talk to me. You're going to communicate with me. You're going to acknowledge me, God says. And when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrite. Man, that's the second time those hypocrites have showed up in this passage. Hypocrites. Hypocrites are play actors who betray their inner feelings by putting on a face that is different from their heart. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand up and pray in the synagogues, in the assembly. And they love to stand up and pray on the street corners. Luke actually gives an example of a Pharisee that is given a prayer, a long and glorious prayer, eloquent. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they will be seen by people. Again, so that they will be seen by people is an improper motivation. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. It's not the hardest part of this job, but a hard part of this job is that at a certain point in the service, somebody's going to look at me and say, it's Ray's turn to pray in front of a whole group of people. And so to pray in sincerity to your, to your Father who's in heaven is what we're told to do, to go into your prayer closet. Well, actually, I think the text says that. <laughs> let, me, let me let the text say it before I get ahead of it. The truly I say to you they have their reward in full was said in 6.2. It's said again in 5 and 6, right here in verse 5. Truly I say to you they have their reward in full. If they're shooting to be seen, if they're looking to be seen and they are seen, then they've got what they were looking for. If you're trying to do God's will in God's way, he'll supply that and make that possible for you. This is the way that we are to do praying. It says, but as for you, disciples, when you disciples go and pray, go into your inner room and close your door and pray to your father who is in secret. He sees what's happening all the time. He sees it whether you're on the street corner or on the stage up here or in public somewhere. But he also sees in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret, he will reward you. It is a, a close and intimate relationship between a disciple and God directly. Jesus has torn the veil, made direct access possible. And we should be taking that for real in quiet moments of prayer in our prayer closet. Now, I've had guys come down when we were missionaries in Mexico, and every morning we would pray before we started the work day. It was a good rallying point. We'd make a big circle. If we had 20 people, it was a 20-person circle. We had 150 people, it was a 150-person circle. 
We always pray for five things before the day started. We pray for the kids. We pray for safety on the work site. Pray for fruitful labor, you know, all this sort of stuff. And we had these five things. And so I would usually lead this little meeting, and I'd say, okay, uh, before we start, we want to pray for the, these five things. Who wants to pray for the kids? Who wants to pray for this? And there was a guy. We had all kinds of different people come down. Some people were construction people, and they knew what they were doing. They knew how to use equipment. We had some people that were desk folks that didn't really but couldn't wait to tie some rebar. We had young and old. We had people who had been Christians for a long, long time, and we had people who were brand-new baby Christians. And one of the brand-new baby Christians said that he had just heard about Jesus and taken him seriously and given his life to him just a couple weeks before, and somebody invited him on a mission trip. And so he's down there, and he's serving. And when I circled up and we start doing the prayer, before I got to the fifth one, he raises his hand. I said, yeah, man, Andrew, you can, you can pray for that. And he goes, no, I got a question. I was like, oh, okay, what's the question? He goes, I mean, I've been reading the Bible, and it says that if we're going to pray, we need to do it in our prayer closet. Why are we doing it out here? Well, it's a good question. I mean, it's kind of just what we do. And it's a part of what we do. It's expected when we get together. We should pray corporately. I think that we should. But we should not pray corporately in order to be seen. So when it's talking about almsgiving and when it's talking about prayer, it'll go on to talking about fasting. I think that there is a temptation that's ever before us. And Hudson Taylor, George Mueller, a lot of the missionary, famous missionaries of the past have gone by, we'll pray to God about what we need, but we're not going to tell everybody what we need. We're going to pray to God about what we need. And the temptation from the front is to say, example, dear Lord, as we gather here this morning, we just want to come before you and praise your name, Lord. If we could have a piano tuner to come and tune this piano, it'd be a wonderful thing, Lord. I don't know what you might want to do, Lord, but the piano tuning is only $425. And if we just had a piano, you know what I'm saying? That's the temptation. When you pray in public to be heard, because then you'll hear people and they go, hey, I could meet that need. And they give the $425 and they want the name in the bulletin. And you know what I'm saying? Like the motivation gets, it's easy to get the motivation off. And I think that it's a, I think it's pertinent for all of us to recognize that we can fall into this because it's just the way of the world. It's the way of the world all the time. As for you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door. For me, what I was saying is one of the harder jobs is to just be sincerely praying about, the, keep the main thing the main thing. And often our offertory prayer is, Lord, do your will in your way. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I mean, the piano does not need a tune, okay? If we do tune the piano, everything's fine. Just a good example of close at hand. And it sounded beautiful this morning, too. You, as disciples, if you're taking him seriously, he's calling you to a higher standard, pay attention to it. And he, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you are praying, I like the verb tense difference right here. When you pray, yeah, that's good. Do it this way. This says, when you are praying, like in the midst of your prayers, right there, whenever you're speaking to God, it's presupposed his disciples will be praying. It's a continuous action verb. And Paul says we are to pray without ceasing. When you are praying, don't use thoughtless repetition as the Gentiles do. Gentiles, there is ethnikoi, which is a plural form, but it's actually an adjective in this case, pagan, heathen, or Gentile in Greek. But the noun form is a Gentile, a non-Jew, a heathen. It usually refers to non-Israelites or a pagan, a non-covenant person. So we use Gentile today to just say, you know, not Jewish. And that's what it meant then. But you can be a Gentile Christian, right? Now, uh, standing outside of God's covenant salvation is the thinking behind this word. So he's saying... When you are praying, do not use thoughtless repetition as the Gentiles, the nations, that everybody else does. God himself has called you into an intimate relationship where you can share with him in the moment exactly what it is that you're thinking instead of doing a proscribed prayer that is already written down. You know exactly what it says. And if you say it in exactly the right way at exactly the right posture, then you'll get what you want. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. I've been to different kinds of temples in different kinds of places where you go in and people are spinning something and saying prayers and maybe even rocking a certain posture, saying a certain thing in a certain way. And that is not a prayer. That is a spell. 
That's not good. That's not good. An incantation, if you will. God is saying, you're not going to be heard because of your many words. You'll be heard because of your sincerity in your heart. So don't be like them. Don't be like them. For your father knows what you need. God already knows what you need. He already knows what they need, as a matter of fact. But they're not asking him. They're trying to get there or do that on their own merits by doing the right thing in the right way. Your father knows what you need. Prayer is really an acknowledging you, you acknowledging your need for God. That's what prayer is. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. If you're listening to Him, He's letting you know what you need. And you can ask anything you want, Jesus says, in His name, and He'll give it to you. Now, that's not a magical inc- incantation. Just put in Jesus' name at the end of your prayer and you get, get everything that you want. It is align your heart with the heart of God and you will have all you need. Before you ask him. He knows prayer is you acknowledging your need for God. So the Lord's Prayer goes right here. It, you know, the disciples ask and Luke teach us to pray. And he does it in Matthew. Here it is. This is where the Lord's Prayer is. And this is it. But I'm not going to let you see it. I'm going to just go for it. I'm going to tell you another story. So one time, actually when I made this slide, it was, it was right after this. December the 23rd, a few years ago, I went down towards Bondurant. And there's Forest Road, 30530. It's like four miles from Bondurant. Someone had gotten stuck, had let me know. I pull people out of the snow all the time. Not an unusual situation for me to be in. December the 23rd, I went down to pull this person out in Tanya's Jeep. That's important. And uh, they weren't just stuck in the ditch. They were a mile and a half off of the road on Forest Road, 30530. And I went down after them and found a real sloppy spot. And as I'm passing the sloppy spot, I said, man, that was some kind of kerfuffle right there. The person said, yeah, that's where the tow truck got stuck last night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't have a winch. I'm just in a tire, uh, you know, Jeep with street tires. And so I went and I got down there and I got stuck. And I mean, super stuck. And the car was also stuck. So the next day I came in, I called member, long-standing member here at the church, had a tractor, lived down that, that way, and I called uh, another member of the church who had a snowmobile, and they both are hardworking guys and know how to get things unstuck. So we went down together, Carl went with me, and we went down there, and we got the chain hooked around the tractor and the chain hooked around the Jeep, and just before he started to pull us out, he got out of the tractor and said, now that I've got both of my pastors here with me, in sort of a compromised position, he said, why don't we say the Lord's Prayer every Sunday like we used to? And rather than go into my theology of this being vain repetition, I said, we'll say it twice this coming Sunday if you'll just get us unstuck. And so I, I made this slide, and we said it twice that next Sunday. And occasionally we'll hit it. We don't do it as a matter of just rote expression because I think it's a beautiful prayer, an absolutely beautiful prayer, but I think it's a model to follow. And we'll go into that at a later date when we're studying that. So I skipped the Lord's Prayer. I went from verse 8 to verse 16. Now, whenever you fast. Oh, my goodness. So his first example is when you give alms. Second example is when you pray and when you are praying. And then the third example here is whenever it is that you fast. Now, that is presupposed. It's not the same exact verbiage as it was before. But it's saying there are times when you will need to fast. There there are times when you need to put aside some earthly need that you have. And it might be food. It might be water. It might be food and water. It might be the Internet. It might be something else that you are used to using. There are times when you do that. It says whenever you do that, though, whenever it is that you need to fast, whenever it is that you fast, don't make a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. Don't make a big deal about it. This is between you and God, and your loving Father loves you. And when you need to concentrate efforts and and go and miss a couple of meals, or maybe more. I mean, Jesus, 40 days of fasting. Wow. When it is that you need to do that, don't make a big deal about it. Don't make a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. Uh, It's kind of funny to me that when people do fast from the Internet, a lot of times their last Facebook post is let everybody know, and then they put it on Instagram and they put it everywhere else, that they're, I'm going to fast from this. He's saying don't do that. Don't, 
Whenever you fast, don't make a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they distort their faces so that they will be noticed by people when they are fasting, when they are doing this. They're seeing it as an ascetic practice to punish their body in order to gain favor with God. But the truth is, everything on earth can be a distraction and everything on earth can be an idol when we are concentrated in our efforts on God showing us the way that he would have us to go. Sometimes it's necessary to fast and put some of those things aside. But it's not to let other people know that we're doing that. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. He said it in verse 2 or 3 and verse 5 again. There's something worldly about that that he's asking us not to do. He's saying, but you're different. As for you, my disciples, when you fast, and this is you will have a time when it comes upon you that you need to, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Look like you look. <laughs> look like you normally look. So that your fasting will not be noticed by people, but it will be noticed by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret, he'll reward you. Sometimes he'll reward you to that answer, to that question that you're fasting over. Sometimes he'll reward you in another way. I don't know what it'll be. But the knowledge of his will is a good way that I can see that he rewards us both in the kingdom of heaven here and in the eventual glorification there. The heart of the matter. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Nothing that we have here is absolutely sure. It can be destroyed. It can be eroded and it can be taken from us. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. If you are a believer in Jesus and you are a disciple of Jesus, you already recognize this fact that whatever you have been given is at the disposal of God Almighty to direct as he sees fit. That's the way that that goes. It's, it's not just been given to you for you. And I'm not saying, I don't want you to hear that preacher was saying, I ought to give all my money to First Baptist. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying whatever it is that you have as a disciple in Christ is at God's disposal to lead you to give however he would see fit. This is do not store up for yourselves, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust destroys. That is absolutely certain. It is the incorruptible hope that we have and where thieves do not break in or steal. And this is about investment. Where your treasure is, present, active, vindictive, third person, singular. This is wherever your treasure is right now. That's where your heart, future, indicative, middle. That's where your heart is going to be. Think about that. Wherever you are investing right now, that's where your heart will be. Wow. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I think the difference in that is something I had not noticed before. I mean, I know the truth of the principle, but I don't think I've noticed the grammar of the sentence before. Where your heart will be is where your treasure is. So be investing in things that reflect where you want your heart to be. The eye is the lamp of the body. This verse to me has always been so psychedelic that I thought it was incomprehensible. And, and I've just kind of not ignored it, but I didn't understand it at all. The eye is the lamp of the body. Now, the reason I think it's incomprehensible is because eyes don't shine like this. Now, some people say, well, her eyes were shining or his eyes were shining. And I noticed that gleam in their eye. The eye being the lamp of the body, it is the place that light comes through into our body. Now, whether they had a, a different vision of how eyes worked at the time, I'm not really sure. But the eye is the lamp of the body. That word for eye is ophthalmos, which we get ophthalmic or ophthalmologist. We have a, one of those in our church, actually. The eye. Uh, figuratively, it's the mind's eye. So the eye literally or figuratively, by implication, it is our vision or the way that we see things. Figuratively, it can also be used as envy. Not as much in the Bible. In the Bible, it's used one time for that. The side eye, like seeing something someone else has and being covetous or jealous of it. It's used once like that in the New American Standard. But usually it's eye or eyes, your gaze or your sight. The eye is the lamp to the body. 
So then, if your eye, or let's say your lens, your vision, your capacity to understand what's going on around you, figuratively, your mind's eye, if the eye is the lamp of the body and enlightens the whole body, if your eye is clear and gives a true reflection of what's actually going on, then your whole body is going to be full of light. Okay. If we look around and see what's going on, truly, the way that God sees it, our whole body will be full of light and will be the city on a hill that is casting that light all around. Can't be hidden. If your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, and it just says bad, <laughs> bad, that's bad. If your eye is bad, if your lenses are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Now, take into account that as human beings, we have a skewed view of what's going on. And when we have given our lives to Christ and when we have come to know his Holy Spirit and he begins to direct us, he says, live by faith and not by your earthly sight, what you're seeing. I will give you new eyes. I'll give you a way of seeing this. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness because... You're seeing things and thinking through a cultural lens, maybe a political lens, maybe a socioeconomic lens, maybe you're just a cultural lens. You will see things through that rather than through clear lenses like God provides for us. When we sing the song, give me your eyes for just one second, Lord. Give me your eyes. Let me see. Or turn your eyes upon Jesus or... Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me, right? It, when we sing that, we're asking for him to take out our lenses, which don't work, and give us new lenses. I have these uh, this morning. Several of the slides didn't make it from my office to the booth up there. And so I'm, I had several slides, and I, I had to read out of an actual paper Bible. And I put these on because I can see y'all just fine. But if it's right here, I can't tell I have fingerprints. I can barely tell I have big lines on my hands. But if I put these on, it's like, wow, that's the, we want the good lenses. We want to be able to see what God wants us to see. And since, like I said, I thought these, these couple of verses were kind of psychedelic. But what is immediately before it says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Then it says this. And then the next thing that it says is, no one can serve two masters. So our eyes are going to be adjusted for either one master or the other. No one can serve two masters. And the word for master there is not employer. It's not boss. It is slave owner. It's the master. No one can serve two slave owners. Every one of us, it is saying, is a slave. No one can serve two masters for either. He will hate the one and love the other. Or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Two masters, if you think about it, in the terminology that's used, it's a slave owner. I want to read something for you. I've got to put my glasses on to do that. A, a man may work for two employers, and we know that in our society, a lot of people have two jobs. Some people have three jobs. And you can work for somebody eight hours a day and somebody else two hours a day, and then a gig over here and a gig over there, and that's fine. Nobody's expecting you to be working 100% of the time for them. But at this time, if you were a slave, you were completely committed to your master, whether you wanted to be or not. You just were. And if you had two of those, imagine being a slave and having two masters. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Nobody can serve as a slave for two different masters. It's just not possible. For either you'll hate the one and you'll love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. The next part of that sentence is this. You cannot serve. God and wealth. So either God will be your master or wealth will be your master. And here's what I want to read. A man may work for two employers, but since single ownership and full-time service are the very essence of slavery, he cannot serve two slave owners. Either God is served with a single-eyed devotion or he is not served at all. Attempts at a divided loyalty betray not partial commitment to discipleship, but deep-seated commitment to idolatry. Yeah, that's a powerful last slide. That, I think that is the last slide, actually, too. 
This is something that Jesus is sitting in your lap right now for you to consider and going, the way of the world is to be noticed. And it's not unnatural. It's natural for you to want to be noticed when you give or when you fast or when you pray even. But he's saying, I don't want you to be like the rest of the world. I'm calling you into doing good works. God's plan A is that his obedient servants would do his will in such a way that their motivation is to please him, not other people. And that those other people would recognize that fact and glorify their, our Father who's in heaven. That's all, folks. I put that one up to just make sure all the slides are still in there. They are. That was a lot easier this time, too. I didn't have to tap dance at all. Not much, anyway. Would you stand up? I think this, this we're going to sing all four verses of this song. And I think the progression, we did this one time for a communion service. And I think that the progression of this song is so important to recognize that what we're saying, God, is we want your lenses. So search me. You search me. Let me know if there's any wicked way in me. Let me see it. And then cleanse me. I praise you for cleansing me. Recognizing that he can and does. And then Lord, take my life and do with me whatever you will. And then, Holy Ghost, revival comes from you. It has to be on you. It can't be on me. And so I want your righteousness. I want to act out of that. Would you sing with me all four verses of Cleanse Me? In number 657. Search me, O God, and know my heart to for today is this one. It's from Matthew 11, 29. We're working our way there. Jesus is describing to his disciples and says to them, 
that his burden is easy. That doesn't sound right, does it? It is, though. He had no sin debt to pay at all. He voluntarily took on ours, and he's saying, live in that. Live in the forgiveness. Live in the blamelessness that I'm going to provide for you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In Jesus' name, Lord, may that be true for us this week. Amen. Thank you.